your current the currency you have that's in circulation that's internationally available has to be absolutely massive because you have to be able to lubricate every transaction on the planet whether it's financial trade or otherwise uh, second you have to not care at all what happens to the value of your currency on any given day because if you go in and actively manipulate the exchange rates for trade purposes say then no one's going to use your currency because they don't know what it's going to do it's not reliable it's not accessible and that means you can't, as a percentage of GDP, have a very significant trading presence in international systems. Because if you did, you would very much care what happened to the value of the currency. And that means there just has never really been a big competitor to the United States. The, the closest, wasn't very close, but the closest was the European Union's euro. But then back in the 2000s, when they had their banking crisis, they confiscated insured bank deposits to pay for the bailouts. Now, mm. they had to do that for political reasons, but that meant economically that no one would ever use the euro ever again if they could help it. And as a result, the euro has gone from the number one trade finance currency to, I think, their number five now. Uh, we always pay attention to the wrong things. Uh, this is something that pops up from time to time. Uh, whenever the United States does something that some country finds annoying or whenever some country thinks that they found a way to crack the code, it has never amounted to anything. But we'd go through this every six to nine months. So the issue right now is you've got the Brazilian president talking about a BRICS currency. And in the aftermath of the United States doing some pretty severe financial sanctions on the Russians, people are wondering if there's a way to get away and what's turning out is there's a whole lot of nothing so you know if I you just want me to kind of go down in the battery of what's gone down here let's do it okay so you know at the top of the list the Argentines say they're all in and I would argue that you should never look to the Argentines for financial guidance unless you're looking for ways to you know do more truancy uh, the Bangladeshis are saying that they will pay the Russians in rubles for a nuclear power plant that they could never afford to build in the first place so it was already a dead project You've got the Brazilians saying they're all on board, but if you look under the hood, <clears throat> you know, you're seeing some very interesting things for the rest of them. The Russians and the Indians actually got into an argument about a week and a half ago about how neither side thought the other side's currency was worth anything, and that dropped the Indians out of the coalition. The Chinese, their first and foremost issue is about making sure that they have full control over their financial system. That precludes the very concept of an open international currency exchange. And even today, with all this talk, they're nowhere near the high level that they used to have for the percentage of their trade that was handled in Yuan. They're not even back to where they were before the financial crisis. And so we've got RNC, whose relationship is a tryst. We've got RNS, who compete. We've got RNI, who don't trade. INC, who don't trust. C, won't let enough happen uh, to make anything move. And that just leaves B and S. And, you know, color me a skeptic. Well, people talk about the yuan, but it will never be that. It, it was the euro until the financial crisis, and then that went away. The next one down is the pound. And until Brexit has figured out one way or another, it's a non-candidate. The Japanese tried to internalize, yeah, excuse me, the, the Japanese tried to internationalize back in the 1980s and got burned because, like the Japanese, they weren't willing to open their financial sector. Uh, and they will never play that role again. So every time we have this conversation, countries are like, we hate the dollar, we want something else, we're going to go try something else. And it always burns them. And then we go back to the dollar. Yes. Those numbers, um, I'm going to challenge those a little bit. The United States. Okay, you're going to challenge the IMF. <laughs> uh, well, it's remember that a lot of countries don't publish their full currency reserve data mm. for national security reasons. But if you look at even what is reported, it's not so much that the dollar has fallen a long way; it's that the euro has basically vanished. So it's not so much that we've switched it from the dollar to other things, it's that we've switched it from the euro to other things. And the Japanese yen and the Canadian dollar are probably the two biggest beneficiaries of that. I want to know if it's legit, legitimate in what way, just that you're over concentrated in a single asset, is that the concern? In oh, dollars. it certainly can't happen overnight because there is yeah. no alternative. I mean, the only other thing that people toss out there sometimes is gold, but we would need something like a thousand times as much gold in circulation as we have right now to even try that. It's a volume issue. Well, the financial sanctions actually weaponized the U.S. dollar really for the first time against a significant state. I mean, when you do it against Iran or North Korea, it's really pretty small, right? It doesn't matter. Russia, Russia matters. Mm. Uh, and 
the Europeans made the decision as part of that process to basically make the euro from a legal point of view a subsidiary of the US dollar system. So you now have the three biggest currency blocks in the world, the dollar, the euro, and the yen that have basically moved into lockstep. And so if you want to have a currency system, you have to have one that is now outside three of the four largest economies in the world and the remaining one, China, is not convertible. So you are saying that you would have to build an independent currency that trades alongside of these that is fully convertible to all of them but is not under their control. So then the question becomes, whose control is it under? Because if it's an independent authority, wow, the best way to get what you want for your country is to bribe the hell out of that authority. And that's one of the reasons why this just can't work. You can really only have one. Yeah, I mean, either it's independent, in which case it's the most corrupt system you can imagine, or one of the countries manages it, in which case that country manages it for his or her own economy, in which case everyone else is left on the outside. And, you know, even with the United States weaponizing the dollar, it is still the least bad option for everyone, even the Russians. One of the things that the Russians discovered when they dumped a bunch of money into the yuan is they went back a few months later and tried to pull it out. And the Chinese were like, no, no, that's okay. We don't want it back. You can keep it. And they had to go back to basically pulling dollars off of international exchanges on the black market uh, and then flying gold around because it was really the only other option they had. Well, I mean, that was a really straightforward conversation. So remember the context of Bretton Woods. Those talks began while World War II was still going on. So if the Brits or the Dutch or someone else had tried to stick it to the United States on financial terms, the U.S. could have very easily said, okay, um, well, A, you clearly can't read a map. Uh, so we're just going to let the Germans hang on to that chunk while we work with the rest. Uh, so, you know, everyone was going to do whatever the United States said at that deal. And especially since the United States really wasn't asking for all that much. Uh, we basically, rather than trying to establish all of Europe and the world as a colony, which is what any of the European powers would have done, we said that we will protect you and we will provide our currency to service your systems and we will use our navy to patrol the global ocean so that global trade can happen for the first time if in exchange you allow your security forces to be put under ours for purposes of countering the soviets so for a security agreement that the europeans were broadly in favor of in the first place they got access to the globe without having to have a military which you know it's something that never happened before